Hello and welcome to another episode of Marty's Matchbox Makeovers. Today I'm doing a makeover of this Matchbox model of yesteryear. It is called a Y15 and it's a 1930 Packard Victoria. These came out in 1969 and there were many variations, including gold and silver wheels, red or brown seats, maroon or black roof, brown or black base plate, and various shades of gold for the body. The rarest one comes with a white roof and a maroon grille and has 12 spoke wheels on it, but they're still only worth about $50, so you won't get rich quick with this model. Now having a look at this, on the underside of this model, uh, the base is painted chocolate brown. You can see that the original colour of this model was a yellow gold, but some child looks like he's painted it with a spray can or pressure pack of white paint. The front headlights are a little bit wonky and that red grille uh, it looks pink from here. It's got a chunky looking interesting rear bumper bar on it with a number plate and some rear lights. I don't know if they're fog lights or what. This happens to be bent so I'm going to have to straighten it out. Anyway, to start pulling this thing apart I thought I will first remove the tyres from the rims of the wheels. The first one I did broke, it split and uh, I had no alternative but to take it off and you'll have a look at it. I'm not particularly pleased that this happened, this is the first thing in this model and I'm going to have to fix that now. I don't have any spares. So now I'm being a little bit more gentle on the other tyres that are on the model, just trying to tease them loose. But I realise they are too brittle um, to be pulled off and I'll risk breaking them all. So I've used this technique before, I've put the model in a bowl of boiling water and I let it sit on my kitchen bench for a couple of minutes to warm those rubber tyres up and hopefully make them supple enough so I can remove them with ease. Now I must admit that these tyres are some of the hardest tyres I've ever had to try and take off of a model without breaking them. And the reason is they're actually like tyres in that they have a groove on the inside that sits over a flange on the rim. You can see you've got the visible rim with the spokes and then you've got the invisible piece of the rim that actually projects outwards and into the groove in the tyre. So that's why they're so difficult to pull off. I was quite lucky I didn't damage any other tyres. So the hot water method worked in this instance. But you can see they're black on the inside and white on the outside because the spray paint couldn't, couldn't get to the inside. As you can see, I am unable to remove the two spare wheel tyres. They are stored in a housing on the running board, which is part of the base. So I'll have to separate this model first to get those tyres off. So I glued the one that I broke with some Starbond black super glue and held it in my vise and I'm hoping it's going to fix it. Now there's five rivets on the base here that have to come out. So I'm looking for a suitably sized drill in this little set of drills that I use specifically for removing the bases. There's usually the right size drill in this little set that I've made up. And this one here will do part of the job. And this one's slightly larger to remove the top of the rivet. So I'm going to try and use that one first. I don't really want to damage the base if I can help it. And I'm going to try and remove the minimum amount of metal because my plan on this model is to force it apart and then force it back together again so I don't have to drill and tap the post like I normally do just for something different and now I'll see if it works maybe it might look better maybe it will look worse but I'm just trying something different out so that's the two main rivets worn down that hold the body to the base and I'm just trying to lever the base off the front comes away but this is very well made and uh, it's more of a struggle than I imagined. I've got the front off but the back is holding firm. Now let's have a look what's going on. I take this trunk off the back which is black plastic painted white so I shall be cleaning that later. 
And there's this handy little metal tongue here that I can put a flat bladed screwdriver under and release the rear end of this model. And wow, what a surprise. Inside, there's a spare tire and I'm thinking this is awesome news. How did that get in there and why is it there? But I thought, that's good because I split a tire, but now I've got a spare. But I soon realized it was actually the not, not the right one for this model. And it's slightly undersized. So how it got in there, I have no idea. Maybe a staff member at the, at the factory thought, I'll put this in here as an Easter egg to be found in 50 years time. Or more likely, some kid that was playing with it thought, I'm going to stick a tire in there. <laughs> Makes you wonder why though. So anyway, after that, I've now got to take off the front bumper bar and the rear bumper bar. This front bumper bar on this model is missing. It's only a tiny little bit of it left. Now, here's the story. I bought three. No, I was given one of these models and I bought two more off eBay. And I have enough spare parts now to make two out of the three. So I'm not too concerned at this stage that that front bumper bar is missing because I do have a spare that I can rob and put on this model. Now I'm just prizing off the rear bumper bar here. And I'm having a few problems so I'll use a screwdriver as a pivot point for leverage to gain extra leverage and pow! That thing just vanished like magic. And where did it end up? Uh, on the floor over here. It must have ricocheted off the blinds and bounced back. Uh, sometimes these things vanish and it can take an hour or more to find them. I'm sure if you're into this hobby you know exactly where I'm coming from. Anyway, have a look at it. It's bent. I'm going to have to use some heat and straighten that out later on. Anyway, I'm still pulling this thing apart. And I notice here there's some horrible gungy stuff and it's quite yucky and I just I, I thought should I show this or not but I think you need to know what, what kind of things you might see when you pull these apart it's not all um, that pleasant at times so I clean that off I'm um, looking at these wheels Norm, normally or often is the case I grind off the end of the rivet there's not really much there that I can get access to and I'm scared I might wreck these beautiful spoked wheels. So I'm going to try something different by putting a small washer over the end and my Dremel, using my Dremel with a grinding cylinder on it. I thought I might be able to press home here and, uh, and not be too scared of wrecking the wheel because that washer is protecting the wheel from any damage. And it did actually work, but it wasn't as easy as I was hoping. So I end up cutting the other wheels off. And I have to make up some fresh axles. And how do I make these fresh axles up? I oh, hear you ask. Well, I use an old favourite of mine. Some pop rivet or blind rivet shanks. So here I am in my shed and I have a little tray here of mixed pop rivets we call them and I rummage through them and I find some that are the exact same diameter as the originals the original axles and I'm just knocking off the collar on the, the shaft there and now I can use the shaft as an axle so I'm just doing a test fit uh, is it long enough that is the question has to be over length if anything and this is this is a perfect length slightly over length and a nice sized rivet head to replicate the original rivet end or axle end so i'm quite happy with that i'll cut off the front ones and boof off goes something else and i rummage around and eventually find it now this time around i've learnt from my lesson I'm, I'm retaining the wheels so that they don't disappear on me because it's the last thing I want to be do. The last thing I want to do is to be slowed down 
by having to hunt for things in the hobby room. There's so much stuff in there and a lot of hiding places. Now, to my surprise, I noticed that the base of this model is in two pieces and it's held together by that big, big rivet in the middle there. Uh, it's a little bit loose. That piece there is separate to the big bit. And I guess they use the same parts for different models and just interchange them as and when required. That's why the base is two parts. So what I do is I put this flat on my metal vise and I whack that center rivet with a drift and a hammer and it goes tight again. So that's how I fix that. Now I've got to take the front grill off and that is white, uh, sorry, that is red plastic and it's held in place by just two protrusions on the back of it that are mushroom shaped and they just press out like that. I'll show you here what I mean by mushroom shaped. They are shaped like mushrooms. There you go. So that's good. I didn't damage it. I can push that back in. There's a lot going on in the front here. It looks a really complicated assembly. It's not that complicated really. It just looks weird. And you also notice that the headlights are bent. The window frame is loose. Uh, look underneath, that's held in with a combination of a large rivet and two projections on the underside of the bonnet that prevent it from being withdrawn rearwards. But it's all worn and been wiggled by little fingers over the years, so I'm going to have to try and tighten that up as well when I put it back together. Now I'm removing the black plastic steering wheel because I want to give that a clean. And I also want to clean the the metal dashboard so the steering wheel would be in the way. Now that's a square plastic plug that has been mushroomed over but with heat or similar. So I'm just cutting off the end of it and now I'm poking it back through the square peg through the square hole and the steering wheel comes off and there's a close-up of it. You can see the square end of it that goes into the square hole I was talking about. Now all that drilling and gunge and stuff, I clean up quickly. And now I'm on to the next stage, which is paint stripping and colour matching. Well, with the coronavirus going around, there's a lot of restrictions on your travel here. And I can't just pop down to the local hobby shop and get a matching colour, which is what I'd normally do. So I'm going to have to use what I've got on the shelf. So I've got the brown Tamiya there. Not exactly the right colour, but close enough. And I don't have any of this gold. This is like a yellow gold. But I do have this other model, which is a Y11 Lagonda Drophead Coupe. And it comes out in this gorgeous orangey gold. And I do have something similar. It's this honey gold from scalfinishes.com. And it was donated to me in a box of various paints. And I'm thinking, well, seeing as Matchbox mixed and matched all their colors from time to time with different models, that this model will not look out of place if it's that darker orange color. So that's the color I'm going with, the orange gold. Now I'm going to paint strip the old paint off and I've got the paint stripper in this old ketchup bottle and I've marked it with a skull and crossbones so that nobody would be foolish enough to ingest any of this stuff by accidentally putting it on a, a beef burger for example. So there's a safety tip in the hobby room there. Always label your bottles. You know, there's kids around and chemicals abound. So after I've applied it to the model, I just smooth it out all over with this soft brush and leave it for two, three, four, five minutes or so. And you can see all the paint starting to blister off there. And then it's a simple case of removing the paint from the model with a variety of brushes, toothbrushes, toothpicks and running water, etc. And this is what you're left with. A couple of things left on there, little bits of paint. So just using this wire wheel, just scuff away into those little grooves and get that paint off that didn't, didn't want to come off with the rest of it. When you're using these little wire wheels, I do recommend you put some goggles on because those little wires can fly off and hit you in the eye or in the finger or whatever. 
for the dashboard and the bump bars I'm using a little bit of auto sol and polishing up with a cotton bud because I realized that these parts are actually raw metal on the model so it's not paint they're all raw metal I want to make it look nice at least so I thought I wouldn't paint these parts I'll just clean them up this is a bit annoying these headlights are out of alignment how often do you see that on the freeway when you're driving to work at night and you're blinded by an oncoming car because one of his headlights looks like it's on high beam and the other one looks like it's on low beam, but they're out of alignment. So I use a little gas torch there just to warm the metal slightly, make it a little bit more supple and try and straighten them up. It's not easy though and it's I have to err on the side of caution because if I broke this I would be devastated. That's why it's not probably as perfect as it could have been. I was being overly cautious, I guess you could say. Now I end up putting all these bits just out of curiosity into my ultrasonic cleaner. I've got some circuit board cleaning solution here that is recommended to be used with these types of cleaners. And to try and conserve it and make it go a little bit further, because it's quite expensive, that liquid, somebody suggested that you put the liquid, the cleaning liquid, in a separate container and float that in normal water. And the ultrasound waves, ultrasonic waves, apparently penetrate the various containers and you still get agitation. And if you can see here, there's a close-up, and indeed the parts are moving around, and there is dirt and flakes of grime or something coming off of those parts. So I leave that running for about 10 minutes. Whilst I do, I'm having a look at these. I've polished them up, and they look quite nice. They're pretty much ready for undercoating. After I paint stripped them, by the way, I did wash these in hot soapy water to try and get rid of as much of any of the paint stripper residue that might be left behind because when you go to paint these things it can be very annoying at this stage if the paint doesn't go on properly so once again I'm using the Tamiya fine grey primer because I bought a load of it before the shops were going to close I got some in so I've got plenty of this now to keep going for the time being goes on really good never had a problem with this stuff and I think I'll probably keep using it although Matchbox didn't ordinarily undercoat their models I do probably because Matchbox cars when they came out of the mold I'm sure they're all shiny and, and even coated all over but over the years the metal oxidizes and you have different shades of grey in areas and uh, that's why I undercoat because the top coat can look a little bit iffy otherwise. So here's all the parts out of the ultrasonic cleaner. The metal bits turned out all right. Um, I'm a little bit aghast when I pull out the wheels and I look at them and they went in lovely and chrome and they have come out dirty looking plastic. So all the chrome has been taken off these these wheels look at that one there it's brown plastic and the paint hasn't been touched on the tires that's still as as it was as thick as it was so overall not a lot of progress made that paint softened a little bit but I'm gonna to have to try and use something else to get the paint off that rear grille again a bit ordinary but hey I had a win with the steering wheel that come out like new <laughs> So this sorry set of pieces here, I'm going to have to do more work on them. Um, here's a close-up of the dashboard though. Check out the detail in this model. Got three instruments there and on the back there there's a number plate and a couple of lights. The headlight detail is interesting too in the reflectors there. And there's also a small cap on the radio at the top there. So they certainly didn't lack in detail these models. Anyway. Ten minutes later, 
I've got a couple of clean looking wheels here. How do I do that? Well, I used an old method. Haven't used it for a while, haven't had to. The dot four brake fluid. Put some in a little shot glass and using some more cotton buds. You can very gently clean plastic parts without damaging the plastic parts. And it's great for removing paint. So I'm demonstrating that now. Not particularly good choice of part because there's a lot of iffy little tiny edges and corners and valleys on this trunk. However, I did manage to get it off with toothpicks in the corners. Here's the, the other tyres I did. Now for the, the spoilt uh, spoked wheels, I'm going to paint them with this Molotow Chrome ink. Uh, I tip some out here, I go a little bit too much. A bit wasteful for me because these are expensive pens. I'm going to have to get another one very soon. And that lump there is the ball bearing that is in the tube when you shake it up. That was most unexpected when that came out. Anyway, I'm not picking it up to put it back in because once you get this stuff on your fingers, you end up getting it everywhere on your trousers, on your face, on the model. And you have to be very careful with this stuff. I don't know what it is. I always seem to ruin a model or get it where I don't want it to be accidentally. Didn't happen today though. Now these have been undercoated, let's have a nice look at the detail. It really makes it, shows it up, highlights the detail. There's the hinge for the bonnet we call it. Yeah, some people call it the hood. There's uh, a bit going on at the back there where the trunk attaches. Maybe those are strap latches or something. The details on the door, you've got the three point hinge and the door handle. Uh, interesting sort of detail on the side of the engine there as well. And I do like the leaf springs here. That's a very nice detail right there. Underneath, transmission housing, tail shaft and exhaust. So nice detail in this model by Matchbox. A fuel tank on the back with a fuel filler cap and a couple of pedals on the floor inside the car. Now this is the front of the radiator, the radiator grille. I painted it with this Tamiya Bright Mica Red that came straight out of a can. A pressure pack. This paint I'm using, it says on the label, set your spray gun to between 20 and 30 PSI. So I did that. Normally I run about 40 PSI just out of interest, but it, this did actually go on really nicely. I was very pleased, it's pre-thinned. And all in all, a pretty, pretty good product, as far as I can tell, it's the first time I've used it. Scowlfinishes.com, if you want to go ahead, go over and order some, feel free. Say Marty sent you. Now the brown paint here, I've uh, added some leveling fluid, Tamiya leveling fluid. I've started doing that because you get a nice high gloss finish. This is such a heavy base that these magnetic clamps are struggling to keep it up in the air. So I just place it on the base of the spray booth there and leave it to dry. Um, to speed things up after I dry it, after it's kind of air dried, I put it in my little pizza oven and leave it for 10 minutes around about 50, 60, 70 degrees C. And that just cures the paint so you can handle it and you can be rough with it and not leave any fingerprints on it. Right, I'm putting the tyres back on the rims as you can see. They certainly go on a lot easier by heating them up in the hot water. It's still a bit of a struggle. These tyres really are some of the hardest I've worked with. And after you're fumbling around there, and I've noticed that the chrome's gone a little bit dull, as has the tyre. I don't know if that's an effect of the hot water or not. So I give the tyres a bit of a spruce up now. I wasn't going to bother because I was quite pleased with them before, but because they've dulled down a little bit, I'm going to put some X1 tyre wash on there, which I make by just diluting the X1 gloss black 
with a lot of thinners. Paint it on and it just refreshes the tyres a little bit. These parts here, the paint came out absolutely beautiful. I'm quite liking this colour actually. I think that if it wasn't an original Matchbox colour for this model, it should have been. It's a little bit lighter than the Lagonda colour that I showed you before, uh, which is strange. You can never tell what a paint is going to turn out like until it's dried and on the model. So Now, here's all the parts that are ready to go back together. And I've actually robbed a roof and seating from one of the other two models I've got. Like I said, I've got three of these models. I'm hoping to make two out of the three. So I've got all these parts now. I can put this back together and see what this little custom Packard Victoria, what a strange name that is for a car, will look like. I painted the centre of the steering wheel just to add my own little bit of interest to this model. I also did the door handles chrome at the end. If you uh, wait till the end, you'll see what I'm talking about. This window was a hell of a job getting it back into position. Somehow you have to simultaneously hook it behind those lugs and force it forwards under the splayed end of the rivet. I did struggle with it. Lucky I baked that paint on there because there's a lot of manhandling of this model when you're putting it back together. Just checking out that that windscreen is in the, on the correct angle. And to make sure it doesn't go wobbly again, cheating a little bit here. I, I, when I use glue, I always feel like I'm cheating. But it is a modern alternative to welding or riveting. And people use it a lot. So this is a five minute two part epoxy resin. Errol Knight, it's been around for years, very popular product. Just make sure you use equal amounts. You've got a couple of minutes to get it into position and then it starts to uh, go a little bit solid. So I'm hoping that's going to set and hold that windscreen so it's rock solid again. And it ended up, it did do that in the end. I'm in my shed now, that's why the lighting has changed. And I'm putting the wheels back on using my pop rivet axles. It's a little bit over length there, so I'm just going to use some wire cutters and cut the tip off roughly where I want it. That's a little bit better. I'm sure some of you have seen this before. What I'm using here is a drill press with a nail punch in it, and I'm pressing down to make that axle end mushroomed like the original was. The back end I heated up and straightened out, pressed that back on and it went on great, it's solid. And it's solid because I used a little splash of Starbond black in, uh, super glue again. Sounds like this thing's glued together but it's not all glue. Here you can see the grill isn't sitting right because I didn't quite push it on hard enough. So I don't want to damage it so I've just cut out a little square of cardboard there and using some long nose pliers I squeeze strategically time and time again and there we go it's pushed home again and sitting flush and it's not going to fall off. Two main rivets going back into the base now, through the base. They are very tight fit and I did have to use a lot of pressure including a hammer and flat punch on the back there to get that rivet head through the hole. One strike and that is solid. The borrowed interior sits in, there's two pegs underneath, sit in those holes. The steering wheel goes back in.
another shot of those little instruments there. What would they be? Clock, taco, speedometer, something similar. Never seen one of these in real life, so I'm just guessing. Just one last thing. No, there's two last things. One is the front bumper bar and then the roof. And then we shall sit back and have a look at this model and see whether it looks any good or not. And it's now that I'm looking at the back there and thinking, hang on, there is supposed to be a trunk there. What did I do with the trunk? And do you know what? I spent over an hour searching the house for that. I emptied the bin twice, went through it, made a right mess, kept looking everywhere, looking everywhere, looking everywhere. And then after about an hour and 10 minutes, I saw it. It's hidden amongst these utensils. Can you see it? That little black trunk. It took me ages to find it. Anyway, eventually I snap it back onto the model and this model is now complete. So here's a reminder of what we started with this morning. A white model sprayed with a spray can, bent up and looking pretty ordinary. And this is what it looks like now. I must say I'm rather pleased with the choice of colours that I picked. They are not original but they kind of suit the model and anyone with no knowledge of Matchbox cars would think that these were the original colours of it because it looks so good. That red grill, I don't know whether they were really red in, in real life, would seem an unusual choice. However, this model turned out okay in the end and I'm quite pleased. So here's a few pictures I took up close of some of the details of this model. And I think you'll agree, it looks gorgeous. Okay, time to show this car off. I'm going to drive it down to the garage where Kevin's working part time. Hi Kev, how are you going? Do us a favour, look at these brakes, they're squeaking like crazy. This place has got a really good reputation. Kevin's manager told me he's picking things up really fast. I'm just nipping over the road to get a cuppa and I'll be straight back. Geez, that was quicker than I thought it would be. I hope that squeak got. Whoa! Oh! Thank you so much for watching. This is Marty from Marty's Matchbox Makeovers saying, see you later. Community too. For bottle shop locations, visit first to camel to find out. Watch the major and country areas. Oh, f. Oh, f. Oh, f. Oh, f. Oh, f.